Hello, I'm Naomi Kikon. You're watching the Eye on Hornbill TV, and here are the headlines for today. After a video of a top national highways and infrastructure development corporation limited official allegedly demanding a bribe from a contractor in Mogotun surfaced on social media, the accused has denied the accusation. After Manipur reported two cases of black fungus or mucormycosis for the first time, one of the patients, a 46-year-old male from Imphal West, undergoing treatment at a private hospital expired yesterday, according to sources. The World Health Organization has renamed the B1617.2 variant of the coronavirus, first identified in India as the Delta variant. After a video of a top national highways and infrastructure development corporation limited official allegedly demanding a bribe from a contractor in Mogokchung surfaced on social media, the accused has denied the accusation. The official claimed to Hombil TV that he was being falsely accused and that an FIA will be filed. In a telephonic conversation, the official claimed that the video had been tampered with and only work-related matters were being discussed in the video. The video, which seemed like it was being secretly recorded, shows the NHIDCL official demanding 1% from the contractor, while saying that he never accepts 0.5%. Bundles of money can be seen on the table. The Nibudu district reported two COVID-19 deaths in a single day. One patient reportedly died on June 2, Wednesday morning at about 4.30. Medical authorities informed that the patient was found to be positive and was admitted to the district COVID hospital on May 31 at 9 p.m. On admission, the patient, said to be a resident of Old Town Colony in Zanipoto Town, reportedly was suffering from shortness of breath and loose stool. Updates stated. Another patient, said to be a pastor who was reportedly much ill, was brought to COVID-19 tests from Surahutod, update stated. Upon arrival, the sample of the patient was taken and while the test was in process, the patient reportedly died while waiting for the results. Later, when the result was seen, the patient was found to be COVID positive, update stated. The mortal remains of the person have been taken to Surahutod for burial, updates informed. After Manipur reported two cases of black fungus or mycosis for the first time, one of the patients, a 46-year-old male from Imphal West, undergoing treatment at a private hospital expired yesterday, according to sources. The other, a 49-year-old patient from the same district, who also reportedly had black fungus, is currently undergoing treatment at Reims Hospital. The state's health authority has stated that all hospitals, health centers or clinics are reminded to report such cases, failing which may attract actions. The Northeast Border State recorded 798 new COVID-19 positive cases, taking the state's total infection daily to 51,549 besides, increasing the total number of active cases to 8,942. The new positive cases were detected from 13 districts in the state and maximum numbers of cases were reported from Imphal West 323 and Imphal East 208 districts. On the other hand, the state reported total fatalities of 18 COVID-19 patients, taking the state's COVID-19 death toll to 825. With 629 recoveries in the past 24 hours, so far 41,782 persons have recovered. The recovery rate stands at 81.05%. As of Tuesday, 6,79,490 persons were screened at the entry points of the state, while 7,23,556 persons, including 5,720 persons in the past 24 hours, were tested for COVID-19 in the state. On the other hand, the state has so far given 3,88,534 anti-COVID jabs to residents. An unidentified has been caught on camera stealing two phones from a patient at the Timapur District Hospital's COVID-19 ward on June 2 in Dimapur. The incident allegedly happened at about 1.30, updates stated. Medical Superintendent Dr. Kilasanyo Mehta told Hornbill TV that this is the fourth time that phones have been stolen at the hospital. Dr. Mehta said that the theft was detected after reviewing CCTV footage. At the time of reporting this, updates said that an FIR was being prepared with the East Police Station in Dimapur. 
A group called the Kalos Society, Futsuro Town Baptist Church, Leshemi Women Welfare Society and Farmers of Futsuro Town in Pak District shared a truckload of vegetables and firewood with, ba with Payavu Panchayat and the COVID-19 Committee on, of Payavu Ward on Wednesday, June 2 in Kohima. Kini Watch, chairman of Payavu Area Panchayat, expressed appreciation for the Futsuro Town Baptist Church Kelo Society, Leshemi Women Welfare Society and the farmers of Futsuro for donating organic vegetables to the residents of Payavu and frontline workers. Receiving the donation with thanksgiving to God, he said the community's prayer that God will continue to bless the people with good health and the land with fertility, that the yield not only brings economic profits to them, but also help them continue the charitable work in the future. He informed that Kelo Society of Futsiro had donated firewood to the Hindu Society of Kohima for use at a crematorium for performing the last rites of the needy and the unidentified. The Hindu Society has expressed profound gratitude to Kelo Society. The World Health Organization has renamed the B1617.2 variant of the coronavirus, first identified in India as the Delta variant. In a statement, the WHO said that it convened an expert group that recommended using easy to pronounce and stigmatizing labels for variants of interest, VOIs, and variants of concern, VOC. The group recommended using letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, which will be easier and more practical to discuss by non scientific audiences. Apart from the B1617.2 variant, the B11.7 strain, first identified in the United Kingdom, has been identified as Alpha variant. The VOCs that were identified in South Africa and Brazil have been named Beta and Gamma respectively. As for VOIs identified in the United States, Brazil, Philippines and other countries, the WHO has used nomenclature like Epsilon, Zeta, Iota, Theta and more. The Supreme Court on Tuesday asked the Centre to provide information on the recently launched PM Cares for Children scheme for kids orphaned by COVID-19 and directed states to appoint nodal officers to apprise it on identification and welfare measures for such children. The National Commission of Protection of Child Rights in its affidavit said, meanwhile, that as per the data given by states so far, 9,346 children have either lost both or one of the parents due to the deadly virus. As many as 1,742 children have lost both of their parents and 7,464 have lost one of the parents. The child rights body told the vaccination bench of justices El Nageshwara Rao and Aniruta Bose. The top court took note of the submissions of lawyer and amicus curia. Gaurav Agrawal, that Prime Minister Narendra Modi on May 29 launched the scheme which aims to provide various reliefs to the children orphaned by the pandemic and he did not have much detail about. Under PM Cares for Children scheme, various steps would be taken including providing a corpus of rubies, 10 lakh when the beneficiary child turns 18 years old. The fixed deposits will be opened in the names of such children and the PM Cares Fund will contribute through a specially designed scheme to create a corpus of rubies, 10 lakh for each of them, the government had said in a statement earlier. Additional Solicitor General Eshwarya Party undertakes to file details of the scheme. The Union of India shall also furnish the information relating to the mechanisms for monitoring the scheme, the bench said in its order. The bench directed all states and union territories to appoint nodal officers of level of secretary or joint secretary who will interact with the amicus curia for providing information on orphans, their identification and about the welfare measures for them. The Indian Union Muslim League has moved the Supreme Court challenging the recent Ministry of Home Affairs notification seeking applications for citizenship from non-Muslim refugees from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh. IUMLS moved the Supreme Court against the center's notification, making it possible for persons residing in certain districts belonging to minority communities such as Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains and Parsis in Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan to apply for Indian citizenship. The center on Friday invited non-Muslim refugees such as Hindus, Sikhs, Jains and Buddhists belonging to Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan and residing in 13 districts of Gujarat, Rajasthan, 
Chhattisgarh, Haryana and Punjab to apply for Indian citizenship. With Friday night's order, the total number of districts where such a facility is available has gone up to 29 districts in nine states. The Union Home Ministry issued a notification to this effect for immediate implementation of the order under the Citizenship Act 1955 and rules framed under the law in 2009 even though the rules under the Citizenship Amendment Act CAA enacted in 2019 are yet to be framed by the government. When the CAA was enacted in 2019, there were widespread protests across the country and had even led to clashes and riots in Delhi in early 2020. According to the CAA, Indian citizenship will be given to non-Muslim persecuted minorities from Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, Hindu, Sikh, Jain, Buddhist, Parsi and Christian who has come to India till December 31, 2014. Delhi reported 576 COVID-19 infections in the past 24 hours. The city reported the lowest number of COVID-19 cases since March 17. On March 17, the national capital had reported 536 coronavirus infections and three deaths in a day. Delhi has been reporting below 100 deaths for the last three days. On Wednesday, the city reported as many as 103 deaths, taking the total deaths in the city so far to 24,402. Delhi has been under strict lockdown since April 19 and with continuous decline in daily cases and positivity rate below 5% from the last week. Delhi witnessed a steady decline in COVID cases and positivity rate for the last three weeks. The national capital, which has been under strict lockdown since April 15 due to the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, is undergoing phase-wise unlocking since Monday, May 31st. The government has reopened construction and manufacturing units while the lockdown restrictions have been extended till June 7. According to Delhi government's health bulletin, the active COVID cases have reduced below 10K, of which 4,531 COVID-infected people are in home isolation. The center may grant indemnity from liability to Pfizer and Moderna to speed up approvals for the vaccines in India, health ministry sources have indicated. A top official with the government has said that there is no issue in granting indemnity to the two giants in India and the approval will be in line with the approach taken by U.S. and other countries administering both vaccines. In what could prove to be another shot in the arm for India's vaccination drive against COVID-19, foreign jabs approved by specific countries and WHO for emergency use will not need breaching trials in India, the Drug Controller General of India, DCGI, said on Wednesday. The exemption will, however, be limited to COVID-19 vaccines approved in India for restricted use in emergency situation, which are already approved for restricted use by US FDA, EMA, UK, MHRA, PMDA, Japan or listed in WHO emergency use listing, and which are well-established vaccine from the standpoint that millions of individuals have already been vaccinated with the said vaccines. The government earlier required local clinical trials or bridging studies that involves testing the vaccine in Indian participants to assess the safety and immunogenicity in the local population for vaccines developed overseas. Pfizer, which is ready to offer five crore doses to India between July and October, had in talks with the government stressed on indemnity, sharing efficacy trials and approvals for its vaccines in various countries and by WHO. Pfizer has immunity in countries like the U.S., where it cannot be used for any adverse effects. India has so far not given any manufacturer indemnity against the cost of compensation for any severe side effects. Bihar police personnel have been barred from using mobile phones while on duty and violators will be punished, said an order by State Police Chief Sanjeev Kumar Singhal, DGP. The motive is to ensure policing in the state stays focused and effective by eliminating a common distraction, the order added. The order says police personnel tend to use mobile phones even during VIP or VVIP visits, law and order situations, festivals, demonstrations, traffic jams, etc., diverting their attention and leading to negligence. At every nook and corner of the city, one can see these constables standing, playing or talking on their phones or chatting with each other. That seems to be their prime duty, the order said. If any Bihar policeman is now found using mobile during their duty, he will invite disciplinary action, the order said. 
Copies of the order have been sent to all range IGs, Inspector General of Police, DIGs, Deputy Inspector General of Police, District SSPs, Senior Superintendent of Police, SPs, Superintendent of Police, and Real SPs. Most Bihar police personnel are not happy with the order. However, they are refraining from making any statements in public, said a police officer who didn't wish to be named. A senior police officer said that Bihar Home Department has been dealing with the twin challenges of a shortage of personnel and reduced efficiency due to overusage of smartphones. He added that the problem was not limited to the police department but was also common among the staff in secretariat. Collectorate, SDO's subdivision officer and CO's circle offices, where the general public is made to wait for a long time while they play with the mobiles. Common residents who often have to cough up fines for talking on phone while driving have welcomed the move. We are fined for talking on cell phones while driving. We often find police personnel either playing games on their cell phones or listening to music. It is good that the same restriction has been imposed on them, said the businessman Prabhat Kumar Sinha. The pandemic has pushed over 100 million more workers into poverty, the UN said Wednesday, after working hours plummeted and access to good quality jobs evaporated. In a report, the UN's International Labour Organization cautioned that the labour market crisis created by the pandemic was far from over, with employment not expected to bounce back to pre-pandemic levels until 2023 at the earliest. The ILO's annual World Employment and Social Outlook report indicated that the planet would be 75 million jobs short at the end of this year compared to if the pandemic had not occurred. And it would still count 23 million fewer jobs by the end of the next year. COVID-19 has not just been a public health crisis, it's also been an employment and human crisis, ILO chief Guy Ryder told reporters. The report showed that global unemployment was expected to stand at 205 million people in 2022, far higher than the 187 million in 2019. But the situation is worse than official unemployment figures indicate. Many people have held on to their jobs but have seen their working hours cut dramatically. In 2020, 8.8% .8 of global working hours were lost compared to the fourth quarter of 2019, the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs. While the situation has improved, global working hours have far from bounced back and the world will still be short to equivalent of 100 million full-time jobs by the end of this year, the reports found. This shortfall in employment and working hours comes on top of persistently high pre-crisis levels of unemployment, labor, underutilization and poor working conditions, the ILO said. And that's it from us for today's English News Bulletin. Keep watching Hornbill TV.